Good morning, everybody, and thank you very much for coming. Um, my name is Sue Llewellyn, and I'm going to be talking for the next hour about how to tweet like a ninja. That's a crazy title, but when I suggested it to Chris, he said, I'll have that, that's fine. So I don't know if you'll be ninjas by the end, but hopefully you will get something from this. How many of you were here yesterday at my um, searching masterclass? Oh, only one. I thought you all looked completely different from yesterday's group. If you do uh, want to find out more about how to search Twitter using Twitter's advanced search skills, then the video is online now. So if you want to find out more about using it for finding information as opposed to putting the information out. Um, so uh, obviously, thank you again to um, International Journalism Festival for having me back. It's great. It's always wonderful to be here. And thank you guys for coming. And there are so many choices on. It's really nice to see that you've um, chosen to come to this one. Um, my background, in case you're wondering what do I know about anything, is um, I spent 15 years as a journalist with the BBC in the TV newsroom, um, and seven years ago I left and uh, decided that social media looked like the future for journalism. So I found out how it worked and was pretty much immediately invited to come back and design all the social media training for BBC journalists. Um, so uh, since then, in the last seven years, I've mainly worked with media organisations and journalists, and I've probably trained around four and a half thousand people. Um, so there's an awful lot of people on Twitter who I've helped through that journey. And like anyone else, and I'm going to ask you in a minute whether you're all on Twitter, but like anybody else, it's a nervous place when you start off. And there are ways to do it really well and ways to do it really badly. The one thing I would suggest to anybody is to remember that pretty much everything you do on Twitter and social media generally is public and permanent. And you need to remember those things before you press tweet. Just think, is this OK? Is it accurate? Um, but remember, it's public and permanent. You can delete them, but you're probably too late by the time you've made a mistake. So just be aware that whatever you put out there could be taken down and used in evidence against you. Um, so I've, as I said, I've trained uh, a huge number of people. I do sort of digital strategy as well. Um, but uh, these are just some of the BBC faces and some of the um, England footballers or um, Olympic athletes that I've shown how to use it. And uh, like anybody else, they'll all be nervous when you start. They're all trying to figure out how you use it, how you find your voice, and all of those things. And I'm going to use a couple of case studies from James Reynolds, who's the BBC's Rome correspondent. Um, so he was one of my victims a long time ago. And he's now sort of getting into using some of the really interesting apps for how to use Twitter. Um, so before you start, really, sorry, I can't see my slides with these on, but I, and I can't see you without them, without them. So I'm going to keep doing this. Um, I always recommend people, you don't know where you're going unless you know where you've come from. So the first thing to do is to, oh, first, first up, who has a Twitter account? Well, probably about 50% of you. Um, so for those of you who don't, I will suggest some of the sort of things you need to do to start, the really basic things. Um, but for those who've already got something going on Twitter, uh, look at how you're doing. And if you look at the analytics um, for Twitter, then you can see each individual tweet, how many people have seen it, how many people have clicked on it, how many people have retweeted it and shared it, and a lot more information besides. And I think that's really valuable to look at every tweet that you do and to see, has it worked? Have you put it out at the right time of day? Is anybody listening? Um, and then you'll realize that a tiny proportion of your followers are online at any one time. So it's perfectly OK to put information out more than once during the day. And this is what some people feel nervous about. Um, so I'm, I've put quite a lot of words on the slides, because rather than taking notes, um, and I'm going to try and speak more slowly. Normally, I speak really, really fast and wave my hands around. So I'm going to try to slow down. But I've put words on the slides, so you can take pictures or look at the video again later, in case you forget something, or in case I don't make any sense, which is possible. Um, so I recommend people start by thinking strategically when using Twitter. Anyone can set up an account and start tweeting stuff. But if you think really seriously about who you're aiming at, why you want to do this, what you want to get out of it, and then you're going to be much, much more efficient if you have a strategy, particularly if you're tweeting on behalf of your paper or your program or a show or whatever, you know, a brand, as opposed to a personal account. There are different types of Twitter account that you can get. So you're either an individual or you're tweeting on behalf of your program. Um, and, and then there's the verified accounts as well, so the official ones with the blue ticks. 
So you need to think, why do you want to do this? Hello, everybody. Come in. Um, and it could be promoting your content or uh, just increasing awareness of who you are and what your program is, extending your network of contacts, um, improving your reputation or ruining your reputation, either or, um, building community, um, uh, and collaborating with audience to tell better stories. Fundamentally, the last point as a journalist is the thing, you know, we really just want to improve the way we tell stories. I do find that a lot of uh, journalists are very much in broadcast mode. They are tweeting out rather than listening and, and, and collaborating with people. It's a two-way space. You don't just sit there and say, it's all about me, um, and this is interesting to you. You know, you need to be listening to your audience as well. <laughs> so it's very disconcerting having my photo taken all the time. Um, this is one thing you have to do in a noisy space. You have got to stand out. You have got to show your best colors, your best side, all of those kind of things. Um, and there are many things to do to stand out. So I'm going to start with the really basic things of when you set up a Twitter account, because a lot of people might just open one, and maybe they don't put the photo up, or they don't write anything about their bio, or they don't even tweet. There's a lot of lurkers, and it's perfectly OK to be a lurker, you know, just sitting and listening, until you get the hang of it. It can be a confusing space when you start. So the common mistakes that most people make is like this one. Um, I'm not blaming him, but he was just somebody, one, one person I trained. He's an egg. Rule number one is you need to hatch if you're an egg. You've got to have a photo. Um, I know my photo is rather a silly one of just eyes, but in a very noisy space, it stands out. I get noticed when I tweet because I've got a stupid photo. Um, the, th the picture behind it is called a header shot. And that's a great opportunity for branding yourself as a journalist. So if you're a political journalist, it could have, I don't know, Westminster if you're British, or um, you know, could have something about your newsroom, something to make you look like a human being that's interesting, because you get one chance to make a first impression. People will land on your profile, and if you are an egg and you don't say anything about yourself and there's nothing in there, why would they bother to follow you? Now, you might want to have an anonymous account, um, and that's fine and be undercover. That's all completely different. But if you want to get the relationships and build contacts, that's what you need to do. So no photo, no bio is not going to help you. All the keywords that you put in your bio on Twitter are searchable. So if you say journalist, somebody's searching for a journalist, they'll find you. Um, and equally, you can find people, which was a lot of what I covered yesterday. Um, uh, your username, personally, I recommend, if you can, having your own name, because otherwise somebody else might take it. But if a username is difficult to remember, people are not going to be able to talk to you easily. So the username there, I think, is, is a I, can't, I can't even see what it says, but rather a lot of numbers. I think he was just experimenting. Um, and when they're actually tweeting, they maybe tweet too long, and it's just all words, and people have to sit and think, what are you actually saying? You've got to catch attention, so photos. If you take one thing away from today's presentation, think visuals, think photos. We are visual creatures. We can communicate a huge amount of information, do great storytelling with pictures. Um, so think pictures. And now Twitter's got so many ways of using Twitter pictures and different apps that you can share um, and enhance your photos. It's going to make a massive difference. So quite a lot of stories that um, go out, people might be saying something, and they don't include a link. So the, the um, follower is left, left thinking, well, where do I go for more information? So if you add links to your stories to point people in directions, that's going to make a difference. Um, the other thing that people make mistakes with is they don't add anything. They just repeat the noise that everybody else is saying. So, you know, so-and-so's just said this. Yeah, I know, I heard it on the radio. Um, add insight or a comment or a thoughtful reason why you're sharing that. So not adding anything, and it's not relevant necessarily. I'm going to have a cup of coffee. Who cares? Who cares? And the who cares question is something you need to ask yourself each time you tweet. Um, the dot at sign. So for those of you who've never had a Twitter account, um, that's very confusing. And quite a lot of people who have got one, it's very confusing. But every username on Twitter has an, an at sign in front of it. So I'm at Sue Llewellyn. If you want to send me a message, you could go at Sue Llewellyn. Hi, I'm in your class today. I get that message. But a lot of people are making a mistake by actually talking to themselves or restricting their audience. I'll try and explain what I mean. Um, oh, and some people accidentally have a private profile, so nobody can see their tweets. That's fine if you only want your friends to follow you, a bit like on Facebook. But if your profile is locked, 
nobody can see what you're saying, so they're very unlikely to follow you. So this one I said, who sees your tweets? Um, this chap here, whose name I've blocked out, is trying to tell us that Zach Goldsmith had said David Cameron has behaved appallingly. Basically, it's supposed to be a public tweet. He's trying to tell his followers what's going on. But by starting his tweet with an at to Zach Goldsmith, only Zach would see that, and David Cameron because he's been mentioned, and anybody who follows this journalist and Zach would see it. So mutual followers, not the majority of his audience. So if I had said, at Journalism Fest is fantastic, loving it, which is absolutely true, um, then only anybody who's following me and Journalism Fest would see it, or Journalism Fest. If I had said, by separating the at from the front, I'm loving it, it's fantastic, or dot, that's one character, it just shifts the at from the front of the, the thing, so then all my followers are likely to see it. So back to the really basics. Um, when you're setting up your profile, um, you need to put in, the, the, like I said, the header shot and the photo, and the edit profile button is pretty obvious. Uh, and so the things that you add would be the keywords to get you found, and a photo, which has to be quite a large resolution picture. Um, and I do think that's important, because when somebody follows you, you immediately look to see who's been following you. And these are just, this is just a random grab of a bunch of people who followed me one day. Um, which one of those am I unlikely to follow? It's pretty obvious. Nigel isn't going to get a look in, because his, I don't know who he is, but there's nothing to tell me that he's of any interest to me. So that's really important. I know this sounds very basic for those of you who are already on Twitter, but filling in the details will get you um, much more engagement. The next thing um, that's really, really, really important is finding your voice and the tone of your voice, and particularly if you're tweeting on behalf of a newspaper or a program. If it's just really boring and there's no personality and no life, nobody's going to be interested. You need to find your tone of voice, and it's got to be authentic. It's got to sound like you. It's got to sound like a human. It's got to sound fun. And so when I'm training presenters or celebrities or, I don't know, sports stars, I always say to them, think of it like a traffic light. The red part of the traffic light is the stuff you should not be saying in public. You don't want people to know. You, you shouldn't be rude to people. You shouldn't be um, giving away. I personally, I think, don't tell people the names of your kids or where you live or any of those sort of security questions. So there's certain things you shouldn't do. You shouldn't obviously criticize your employer. Don't be rude. In a basic, it's not brain surgery. The green part of the traffic light is obviously stuff related to your work, um, journalism in general. You choose the sort of things that you want to share. So there's the obvious safe things that you can share. The amber zone is, I think, where people are, they, they, they need to put more in there, a bit more color. And that's a little bit of insight into your life, whatever you're prepared to talk about publicly. Um, a, lots more photos, lots more stuff that everybody can relate to. So the color and the insight and the, hello, um, all of that kind of stuff. So the amber part, I think, is the bit that you, you need to think carefully about what you're prepared to put out there. Um, but a bit more of that is really going to get you going. So I, for me, I tweet about journalism, social media, anything that makes me go, ooh, I didn't know that. That's interesting. Um, occasionally Alzheimer's, because my mother has it, and I think it's an interesting topic that we should be doing more about. So I choose what to share, but I don't talk about my children. Um, you know, they'd kill me if I did. So... Uh, I, I think there are sort of privacy things. So when you're finding your voice, um, I've got a list on Twitter of people I think have a really interesting tone of voice or they're using it um, in interesting ways. And I've called it good eggs because we all start as an egg when we're on Twitter. And obviously that's an English expression. Um, you can see who some of these people are um, and by following the list. But what I recommend a lot of people do is to find people who are using it well <laughs> and look at what they're doing and see what you can learn from them. So I add people to this list from time to time that I just think you can really hear what they sound like as a person, or they really sound like they're um, insightful or a good an analyst, or they're sharing interesting content, or they're using it creatively. So there are many, many, many different ways of using it. And for you guys, um, I like this picture a lot, I think it's great, uh, you have to decide what you're going to tweet about and how are you going to stand out from the crowd? Because there's a lot of people talking about the same kind of stuff, and it's a really noisy space. So you really need to look and think, what am I going to do? 
What makes me different? What have I got to offer um, my audience? And just remember, I just put this in this morning. I just thought so many people are saying, me, 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 me. Oh, hello, there's something here for you. No, me, 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 me. Always selfish broadcasting. So it isn't that. It's the whole thing with Twitter, I think, is building relationships with people. And when you do, you're going to get so much more out of it. Um, the friendships that you make or the insight or the tip-offs for stories, it's amazing. I've met some fantastic people. So um, my background before being a journalist was a psychologist. So obviously, I would talk about psychology. So I'm just going to talk a bit about the psychology of sharing because I think if you get this, you will understand social media generally. The social, me the social psychology is extraordinary. First, the most important thing with your strategy is who are your audiences? You're going to have loads of audiences. Some of them might be your friends. Some might be people interested in your stories. Others might be your bosses. It depends who it is. So clearly identify your audiences. And when I'm doing strategic planning workshops, I get people to do a mind map where they can put in their audiences and then very clearly say, right, these people need this kind of information. Um, and these people would need sort of other kinds. So my little sort of drawing there. You can very clearly map out what sort of stuff they would find useful or interesting, and then how you can help them. And I know this sounds sort of complicated when all you have to do is tweet, but actually it's not, because if you think a little bit before you tweet, it's going to be easier to find content and easier to engage with people. Um, so think, is it going to inform them, tell them something they didn't know, make their day any better, make their life any more useful? Um, so once you've done that, it really does make a massive difference, particularly if you're tweeting on behalf of a program or a paper or a show or something like that, because there will be multiple audiences. So it's always okay, ABC of social media. A is audiences, first and foremost. B is sort of behavior, and C is the content. Um, so you've got to ask, is it going to make them talk to you or about you or share your stuff? It's got to have something in it for them. I've always said to people when using social media generally, um, what's in it, the wifi point, what's in it for you? And always ask that, you know, so why should that person care about what I'm saying? So try and make them care. The sort of things that, um, obviously I like ridiculous pictures of photobombing animals and, you know, that sort of stuff. I am an animal lover, so that's kind of popular on Twitter generally. Anything fun. But the sort of style of tweets, the things that people would be sharing um, and structure and stuff like that, things that surprise or delight are the most socially shareable stuff because you go, wow, I didn't know that. Um, I'm using them. Stuff to inspire or inform or um, you know, giving information to people or warning them. Warnings actually work really well. Um, or uniting somebody behind a cause or a, or a, a movement that you're doing. Um, or you can make them cross. That's a high-risk strategy, but if you want to enrage somebody, you're guaranteed to travel on social, but much higher-risk strategy. Um, and so the, the, the point that I'm sort of building into for the social media, the psychology of social, is these are the reasons why people are likely to share something on social. And you need to think about that. So the most common reason somebody is likely to retweet you is to make themselves look good. You know, hey, I'm first with the news, or I've got some insight or something valuable to tell you, or, you know, I will look big and clever if I share this link to the story. The number of people who share links to stories without actually clicking on them is quite interesting psychologically because they think, oh, that make, that's going to make me look good. It's good for my image. And you can tell who they are because sometimes the link doesn't work. So plainly they haven't clicked on it because it's a dodgy link anyway. Um, so looking good, to belong to something or join in, you know, and, and the self-identity. I, I tweet, therefore I am. Um, you know, I'm, I identify with what, what you're doing. This is my, my identity. Um, attention seeking, this is where the trolls come in. They want attention, so don't give it to them, don't feed them. Um, but a lot of people are simply there just to get some kind of feedback on what you're doing or, or whatever. The current and the topical, people like to be in with the zeitgeist and, and tapping into topical news. Um, like I said, to be first, but don't forget, first isn't important, you've got to be right before you're first, so make sure it's verified. Uh, to be useful or helpful, this is a massive driver on social. So one of the most shared type of stories in English regions, for example, BBC, is missing children because we all want to help. We want, it's a natural human instinct to try to help people. So altruism is a massive driver. It's their passion. And this is where a lot of journalists are going wrong. 
They're too busy tweeting out and not finding the people with the passion, so the fans or the super fans or the experts in their area, and then they target them. This is what you need to do. So if you find somebody with a passion and you say, I thought you might like this, maybe you'd like to share it with your followers, of course they will do that because that's their nature. And just spending a little bit of time finding those people with the passion will really, really pay dividends to you. I tell a very stupid story, but it's a memorable one in pretty much all my courses. So for a long time, ages ago on, on BBC Breakfast Business, uh, the, one of the stories was um, the, all the DIY stores had reported a rise in the sales of sheds. People who were buying sheds to put in their garden because they were basically setting up their own business. They'd lost their jobs and they were going to be working from home. And I said, that is an awesome social media story because sheds are visual. A lot of people who have a shed in their garden and work at home do it up. They make it look amazing. So I got the two presenters of the program to share their sheds. Um, and I put that out on Twitter and I said, tomorrow on the program, we're going to be asking you to share your shed. The instruction was simple. One photo of your shed, share it with us. Um, and because the celebrity presenters had started the ball rolling, everybody wanted to be like them. So they took a photo, they sent it to us. I went into Twitter and put the word shed into the search term box, and I found people who talk about sheds. There are a lot of them, interestingly. And so they were, um, I found two guys who between them had 7,000 followers, and I said, tomorrow we're asking um, people to share their sheds, would you ask your followers? Of course they did. Three tweets, that's all it took for the biggest audience response ever that Breakfast Edda had. We had shed loads of sheds. There were sheds everywhere. And at the end of the program, we'd been showing them throughout the program, we made an audio slideshow, which was beautiful. So everybody got the reward. That's the other part. They, we asked for something. We then rewarded them by them having it on television. So the psychology of that is find the people with the passion, and they'll do the work for you. Um, a friend of mine made this the other day, which I think is absolutely brilliant, the periodic table of story elements. So if you can include some of these, so this is Houston PR, by the way. Um, uh, if you can include some of these, so it's, oh, did you know that? Oh, wow, or, oh, nostalgia, I remember when. That's a really good driver on social media. I recommend, if you want to take a picture of this, it's great. It does make sense when you think, um, you know, the gossip is, did you know this? Actually, don't do gossip too much on social. Uh, but just the idea of that, these emotional drivers are the key to making it work for you, the whole thing work for you. So remember that when you're tweeting. Um, so the best practice, what sort of stuff works? Um, and that's Sophie in the newsroom. You have to tell people what happened um, and why they should care about it. So they want to share information. Hello. <laughs> um, and analysis and, and context. Why is this story important? You know, what's the background to it? Where can I find more information on it? What's, what's, what's the point of having it? You know, what, what does it mean to me, the person who's following you? So add your insight as a journalist about why it's important. Um, tell them how they can do things, where you can get extra information, so you're offering help. You know, so if, if it's doing a story about taxes or something, you know, where do you find information to do this or benefits that you might be entitled to or, or health benefits, you know, whatever it is, the story. Help them. Um, obviously, then, if you can surprise and delight them and entertain them, I think that's a massive thing. Um, and that's the sort of stuff I enjoy on Twitter. And then be visual. So I've got some examples here of, of tweets that worked and didn't work. And then I'm going to go through sort of best practice bits and pieces. So this was um, a story that um, BBC Breaking and Sky Sports did when um, Alex Ferguson retired. Look at the difference between those two tweets and the different numbers of retweets. The obvious thing when you're looking at that is one of them is really noisy and really confusing and you have to think about what you're reading and the other one is really simple. The simple one got far more attention. So keep it super simple. Um, kiss, keep it super simple. Oh, keep it simple, stupid. Um, so keep it really simple if you can and then you can add more after that but don't stuff too many of the hashtags, never more than two hashtags because otherwise you look desperate. Um, so don't put too much information in. So the, the thing with the breaking news team, that one I think was in um, 2013, they, they could see the difference here. They were learning at the time about how to write good tweets. So fast forward a year, and what you have is another example. CNN had far more followers than BBC Breaking at the time, but look at the different levels of engagement of that one. The key to that is a photo. And the photo, they thought long and hard about it, 
And they thought, we'll use a photo that isn't identifiable with any particular event in history. It's just, oh, wow, wasn't he amazing? Retweet. That's the sort of trigger you get. You get lovely, smiley, oh, gosh, how sad. Retweet. Um, and it worked. Massive amounts of retweets. So if, you, if I still need to bang on about photos, this graph should um, prove it to you. These, this on the, the top left, um, you get 27% or more uh, retweets if you add a photo. Um, adding quotes is also quite good because that stimulates curiosity or it gives an idea of what the story's about. Uh, numbers, when it says digits, so, you know, 26 cats with oh, wearing a hat or something, whatever it is, try not to do that. Um, video and hashtags. Even more so photos with the political stuff. So in Eng England and Britain at the moment, we do it with the election. A lot more visual things, a lot more putting quotes out with photos of the politicians of what they've done. Um, quotes and photos are working really well. This was another example that I did. It was a photographer who was in Afghanistan who was killed. I thought she had amazing work, and AP made this beautiful tribute to her. So I shared the link to the video. And that's what it looks like. And I looked at the retweets and the engagement, and I thought, well, that's crap. She deserves better than that. So I took a screen grab of one of her photos, and I reposted it. And look at the difference. Because it stops people in their tracks. Isn't that a beautiful photo? It's amazing. Father Christmas visiting the troops in Afghanistan. So I put that, and I thought, I did think about the copyright issue. Is that OK? But because I'm linking to the video where it came from, I wasn't too bothered. And I thought she deserved better. Anyway, the point there is, that grabbed people's attention, and it made them look and, and retweet. So photos, obviously Obama's most retweeted picture ever, I think, aside from the selfie, um, the Ellen selfie. But that wasn't even from that moment. They just decided that they were going to have a celebratory human thing, which is going to make you retweet. Or simply sharing a story about the Oscars. Um, the Economist is really good on social. That would make you stop and think, oh, no, I wonder what that's about. Nice, pretty pictures of Oscars. Or... Behind the scenes. This was one of the BBC journalists at the Oscar Pistorius trial who turned the camera around. So this is what he would have seen in the courtroom. Adding the behind the scenes stuff of what you do in your daily life is what the audience absolutely love. So a bit more insight into the process of journalism, how you're making your stories. That sort of making content out of process as you go along bit. Um, so lots more behind the scenes pictures really makes them feel part of the storytelling process. Also being funny, so I love this, how people ignored each other before smartphones. <laughs> if you can be funny and share funny pictures and funny information, um, that kind of stuff just goes wild and you look like a nice human being. So I think if you can share things like this, the next picture is a little bit rude, but boy did I laugh about it and so did other people. So George Osborne um, and David Cameron in the picture, but um, worst picture of George Osborne, especially when you spot the rogue finger. Can you see the finger? Anyway, <laughs> oh, just, it's awful and a bit rude. But um, and you obviously need to decide whether you're prepared to share photos like that, but I think it is, it's just funny. Also, the other thing you can share is things that make you human and some of the sort of foibles or daily things in daily life. So this girl who's a teenager, she was absolutely overwhelmed by the social media response and, and actually had to stop using Twitter for a bit because her notifications were so much. But I applied for a job and got this email back. You attached a Jamie Oliver, for, you know, chili beef recipe, not your CV. <laughs> I just think that's tremendous, <laughs> applying for a job and attaching a recipe. So just by sharing a little mistake she made, it made our days and it got her a lot of engagement. So um, that kind of stuff, I think, is working really well because it's human and it's funny. This was Andy Murray's wedding day the other day. So you can do the emoji talk if you want. This is, there's another talk going on right now about the use of emojis um, in journalism and storytelling. So, uh, and, and one thing to, to see about this, actually, we all, you know, particularly me, I think, oh, I'm a bit old for these emoji things. But, uh, and young people are, are also using them, but they don't necessarily know what they all mean either. It's all open to interpretation, a lot of these things. But I just love that as a story. You can kind of figure out, OK, so it's a sunny day, but it may be a bit rainy. And then she's having her nails done and her hair done. And she's dressed for the wedding and then the car. Um, then they get to the church. And then they're together. And there's some prayers and a ring. And, um, and then you just go on. And there's photos after the church and a video. And they drive somewhere and have drinks and food. And then there's a lot of drinks and food. Loads and loads and loads and loads and a bit of love and some sleep. And that's very cute. And obviously that was shared, I don't know if I've put the thing in, but thousands and thousands and thousands of times. So you can use emojis to tell stories in interesting ways. 
um, like I said, add in quotes. Um, the curiosity value of, you know, it's just one of those things that happens when a two-year-old shoots himself after finding a gun. You think, what? So you're likely to click. The curiosity value. Um, or simply for programs who maybe have had a politician or somebody on, the key quote that they um, had from that. So a lot more programs now, we're getting them to do this sort of thing. So that's the um, Today program on Radio 4. Or you can tell stories. So um, you can share up to four pictures on Twitter in a grid. So this this uh, on the left is what was actually happening in Turkey, and on the right is what Turkish TV were broadcasting. There's an immediate story. You can immediately see what's going on there. Um, also, before and afters, that's a no-brainer. Before and after pictures of things. So thinking how you can creatively use photos to tell stories um, that's going to engage your audience in a, in a really quick and interesting way. Also, um, different sorts of photos that you could share. So sharing statements. Um, so it might be, this was hugely retweeted, the um, family of Michael Brown after Ferguson, their statement. So, you know, it's interesting. Serious news is interesting. Emotional news is interesting. But they did it in a different way. So they took a photo of the statement and put that out. And there's an app that you can get, several apps, that you can highlight bits of text. So you could put those things up. Ooh, my table's wobbling. Um, also, infographics, if you're lucky enough to have a graphics department or you're prepared to try playing with some of the tools that are out there to make your own. There's a really good site called Canva, C-A-N-V-A, um, that's really brilliant for making your own graphics. I can do it, and if I can do it, anybody can do it. So um, you could do that if you haven't got your own uh, graphics department. Here come lots of things with lots and lots of words on them, so <laughs> don't worry about taking too many notes. You could take a photo. If you're going to be crowdsourcing and asking the audience for something, you have to be really clear about what you want from them. Because, and also, I personally think the instructions should be simple, like the shed story. Take a photo, send it to us. Not, can you do this, and then this, and then this, and then this, because they won't. Um, so invite people to tell their stories. And the really important thing when you're crowdsourcing is to, to say thank you and make them feel as though they've actually contributed to something and it's been of value and of use to people. Um, Ask them what they saw, how they felt about stuff. And if it is an eyewitness with a photo, people don't usually just take one picture. They probably take a whole series of pictures, a sequence. So you can get them to tell the story and, and make something from it. Um, also, be very careful repeating you know, unverified or unconfirmed information. So, uh, and always, 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 always remember that the audience knows more than you do. Somebody out there definitely knows more than you do. So um, I like just put that one at the bottom. It's like, are you in China and facing horrendous air pollution? Send us your smog mask selfies in a private message. No access to Facebook in China, mate, says the audience. So they know more than you do. When you're live tweeting, um, if you're live tweeting, uh, um, I don't know, conferences, if anybody's live tweeting, um, and then in fact, actually, if you are live tweeting this, it's pretty difficult with a name like mine to spell it right. Um, lots and lots of L's. So always get people's names and their Twitter handles in advance before you start the thing. Check permissions if you're tweeting from court. That's really important. Check permissions of people that you're photographing and featuring. You know, are they okay being tweeted about or having their photo taken? Um, check the right hashtag for the conference or whatever it is that you're talking about, or if it's a breaking news story. There's often two or three hashtags until they settle down. It's okay to use a couple of them at the start. Add behind the scenes information or um, you know, a little bit of color, a bit of insight into what's going on. Try and build the, the sort of feeling of the story. Um, obviously the key developments in what's going on and maybe you might like to warn people occasionally that I'll be live tweeting this conference for a while so I might be a bit boring. You can mute me for a bit. Never say unfollow me because I'll never come back. Um, but you could make it easier for them by showing them how to mute for a bit or just warning them. This will stop at a certain point. Um, I made a mistake the other day by getting so overexcited and tweeting lots of photos from the Mobile Journalism Conference in uh, um, Dublin. Uh, I lost several followers because I kept tweeting these pictures without saying why I'd done it. So, uh, you know, my lesson learned, but I thought they were nice photos. Um, also, just looking at how people do live tweeting. Um, so this, again, is the Oscar Pistorius trial, and Andrew Harding was there. But you just, you can really feel the story, even though you're not seeing anything. So silence in court. Pistorius has his head down. Magistrate flips through documents. You can just really feel as though you're there by looking at the words that they're using. So if you can do that, um, oh, excuse me, frightened myself. <laughs> I did warn you I would talk with my hands all the time. I have to sit on them. <laughs> Try not to do that again. Well, I need to do that to switch the slides. Um, 
Yeah, so, to, so if you're adding, you know, try and add something, a bit of drama, a bit of excitement, the colour, the little observations that you see of who's looking at whom or the stuff that perhaps doesn't make it onto camera. Um, again, with breaking news, just keep going. And this is the other thing. Um, I can't remember if it's that other slide. Yes, oh, the one at the bottom here. If you are tweeting a breaking news story, an interesting story, look what happens to your followers. There's an exponential rise in the number of followers. If you're on a breaking news story, you keep going and you've got interesting stuff. So keep going and make sure your battery doesn't run out. Always have a spare or always keep one of these little chargers with you. Um, and obviously then if it is breaking news, verify, 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 verify. Make sure that you can verify whatever you're doing um, and uh, using advanced search. So lesson on that. The other thing that you can do when you are doing um, a story or you want to link one part of a tweet to the next one underneath so maybe you've, you're doing I don't know, casualty numbers in something and there's been an update. It's useful to put that tweet with the other one so you can link the two together. So if you've tweeted something and then you reply to yourself and take your name out, that tweet will always be seen under the, the tweet that you've just done. So you could string your live tweeting court thing together or your thoughts because nobody's going to see one tweet and the next tweet and the next tweet. They're not waiting for your tweets. Um, so each one of your tweets needs to be a standalone, self-explanatory, you know, don't assume that people will see part two, even if you do one of two, two of two. So you can always do one of two, and then two of two is linked by doing this, threading the tweets together. And you'll see what it looks like with that blue line. So it's always a really good thing, maybe if you've made a mistake, just to say, actually, that was wrong, um, sorry about that, here's the correct information or spelling or something. Um, Obviously, then, thinking about how you can be creative with different apps. And there are all sorts of different things that you can do. So um, the six-second video sharing app, Vine. I would play you a lot of these, but when I tried to um, do this earlier, the Wi-Fi didn't stand up. Um, but obviously, it's only six seconds, and they loop. But you can be very creative with your um, use of Vine. Some journalists have been using it to say, this is what's coming up on the program. That's quite hard in six seconds. Twitter now has a 30 second video sharing, um, so you can m make longer videos. But there is a place for Vine. Um, so when it was an early, um, first came out, this guy just went around after, a, um, I think it was in Oklahoma, a tornado had destroyed his neighborhood. So you really get a feel for what's going on, and it's dead easy. You just press the button and, uh, and lift it off and put it on again when you want to record something. So I was making one in the bar last night, actually, of my colleagues. Um, so. Uh, Vine is a really useful tool, and, and quite a lot, of, a lot of people are using it for just snippets of information on a story. So the BBC's been using it quite a lot. Um, and I'm sorry I can't play these. Uh, if you can be insightful or you spot something and you're, you can comment on it, then that also will add to the engagement. I mentioned James Reynolds, who's the BBC's Rome correspondent. He's been doing a lot of um, different, using a lot of different apps recently. Um, oh, now I do want to try and show you this one. I'm just going to see if I can get through to it uh, in a sec. But um, So obviously, sharing photos. And this morning, he was using Periscope. Has anybody used Periscope, the Twitter live streaming app? Yeah, so that's new and good fun. I'm surprised nobody's here sort of Periscoping as we go along. But you can just start broadcasting. Anybody can start broadcasting. Um, wherever they are. So this morning he just switched on Periscope and was showing um, the scene in Sicily where he is. Uh, so not just a photo, but you actually get the full impact of what's, what's going on. So people are all broadcasting uh, all sorts of stuff. There's going to be a lot of noise and a lot of rubbish, but it's also a great tool for journalists. So if you can download Periscope and link it to your Twitter account and practice, and you maybe want to practice on a on a fake Twitter account to start with, rather than broadcasting <laughs> rubbish to your followers to start with till you've got the hang of it. I often recommend people have a trial account. So you have two. So you, you can practice your sharing different things from different apps and your style until you're familiar, and then you can use your proper Twitter account. So I quite often test things out on one of my other accounts. Um, so this one I would like to actually show you because it's awesomely good. It's an app called Bubbly. Um, so it isn't just the 360 degree panorama thing that you get, but it also, so when somebody's looking online, they can, they can either look on their phone and tilt the phone up and down or round. So you, oh, I've done it again. You literally get the, I should do it in here actually. You get the full um, thing of the story. So I'm going to see if the Wi-Fi works and just pull this in and show you, but it probably won't. Um, I 
just think it's really, really good. And it also gives you sound. Um, it's not looking too hopeful. Anyway, if you... Um, no, that's not good. Okay, give up on that. But basically, he was in the Sistine Chapel. Um, and because you, you, you move your phone around to, to take pictures of the whole thing, so you, as you're online, you move your cursor, and you can get the feeling like you're absolutely there. It's a really immersive experience and very easy to use. Um, so... This is another app that he's used called Skitch, um, and obviously he's, it's just a way of adding a, um, you know, a point of interest or an arrow, but you can also pixelate somebody out or something out of a photo if you want to. So it's quite good fun. You can just you can use, um, you know, I know that's, I love cardinals using phones. It always amuses me um, seeing, um, you know, people like that, monks with mobiles. Um, this app called Legend, and, and obviously, again, I can't show it to you because the uh, Wi-Fi is not working, but you can have a photo, and you just write your words, and then it animates. It has about, I don't know, 12 different styles of animation, but if you just wanted the words to move on something, it's quite eye-catching. So I did that testing, one, two, three, testing, and then it moves around. So this is the time to take the photo of some of the, photo, the, the apps that you can get for Twitter that, that would be... Um, uh, really useful for you. So you can make a, a, in animated GIFs from photos. Um, the, on the iPhone, the, there is a panoramic function, um, but there's also an app uh, called 360 Panorama, or Bubbly is one that includes the sound as well. Um, so I think that, that sound is really immersive and, and good. Um, Legend, I've just mentioned. Diptych is one of many, many collage apps. Um, on Twitter, you obviously get four pictures, up to four pictures. But if you wanted to do something different with strips or you know loads of pictures, you can you can use a collage app. Pick, play, post adds photo and video. So if you wanted some movement in your thing as well, so you can have stills and then somebody speaking, um, you can have uh, uh, oh, another thing for gifts. Jam Snap adds sound to your photo, so you could have a picture and then you can press and say this is what's going on here, or I can you know, describe the scene. So you can add sound to your um, pictures. ThingLink is great for making interactive things. So you can, uh, you know, add a Wikipedia entry or a photo or a video or something to a picture. So it's, it gives you a lot more information. Uh, touch, retouch, if you needed to take something out of a picture, but obviously be aware of, you know, misleading the audience if you're doing that. Don't, don't do anything dodgy, but, you know, maybe there's just something, uh, you know, you need to clear up. And Skitch is the big arrow one that I mentioned. And obviously, if you want to live stream, Periscope is owned by Twitter. Um, uh, it's, and Meerkat is another one, or Bambooza. So there's many ways of live streaming as well. So while we're talking about how to tweet like a ninja, also how not to mess up. So there's a lot that can go wrong. Um, and much of it is preventable. Most social media crises and things that go wrong are preventable because it's human error. So checking your facts. Check your facts. Check your spelling. Make sure that you've got it right. But I have a few examples for you because that's always fun. So um, David Cameron, this is supposed to be Islamic State, but David Cameron is evil, pure and simple. I don't. <laughs> <But> <laughs> so uh, just thinking about your grammar and stuff like that as well. Um, this one, I'm not sure this translates so well in, in a different language, but Alan Rusbridger of The Guardian. Uh, London may be rich, but many of its people are poo. <laughs> Which, poor. I think was what he meant. Um, so typos, look out for the typos first. Um, and obviously, when people make mistakes, people like me who do training go around screen grabbing the mistakes, and you can do it instantly. So even if you delete a tweet, somebody somewhere like me will have saved it. So just bear that in mind. Um, also, if you're going to schedule your tweets, be really careful. You can line your tweets up to go out later, and that's great if you want to repeat sharing information. So maybe you've got a really good story, and so you put it out in the morning for one audience, later on, and then in the evening and weekends. Evenings and weekends, people have time. This is a really important point. They have time to look at your stuff, so do share it again. But if you are scheduling tweets, make sure you're across the news. Make sure that you know what's going on, like this one. Good news from Joan Rivers Hospital bed. Whoopsie, she just died. Um, so be very, very careful that you know what's going on. And I can't stress that highly enough. So you can have a list, make a list of what you've got lined up, and just be aware that if it's time sensitive or it's related to something bad like this, you take the tweet down. Getting people's names right is another thing. Um, uh, and their photos, I love this one. I think this is tremendous. 
This photo is Javier Bardem, not Vladimir Putin. <laughs> Does he look like Putin? <laughs> it's just great. Um, so a quick recap on how and why you should be using Twitter, what you get out of it. So it's obviously to promote your content and to drive reach and build relationships and all of those kind of things, collaborating with audiences and being a better journalist. But also, how do you do it? You need to tweet regularly. Tweeting once a week is totally wasting your time. It's not going to get anywhere. You need to tweet several times, quite a lot. Um, and kind of, sort of the more the merrier. If you've got something interesting to say, then you keep tweeting. If you haven't got anything interesting to say, then don't. Um, keep it short and simple. Add insight. Uh, be interesting and be human. This being human and being authentic. You know, you, when you look at people's tweets, you get a really good idea of what they're like as a person. And if you think, oh, I don't like the sound of you, that's not going to be good. But if they trust you, trust is the most important thing in social media, particularly as a journalist. Trust and transparency. So be transparent about the process and be honest. If you mess up, fess up, as we say. Own up if you've made a mistake and apologize. They're far more likely to trust you again if you say, I'm really sorry. I not, no, I wouldn't say I cocked up, I would, but um, I've messed up, I got that wrong, I'm sorry, this is the correct information. Then they'll go, okay, could have been me. But if you go, ooh, and delete the tweet, they won't trust you. So um, using hashtags and using photos, mentioning people, you're amazed how many people don't mention people in their tweets. So if you do put somebody's username in a tweet, they get to hear about it. Um, retweet and favorite people's stuff. They will see you. They'll see that you've done something. Because if you're tweeting, unless you mention them, or you retweet them, or you favorite them, or you add them to a list, you're not visible to them unless they're following you. So you need to be much more proactive about engaging with people um, and joining in conversations. Initially, it's, I found it really strange when I joined Twitter in 2009, jumping into somebody else's conversation. It's a bit like, hey, I'm here. Can I join in? And it's, yeah, if you've got something interesting to say, of course you can. But if you haven't, then don't. So, do join the conversations and do, you know, give back. The more you give out, the more you get back. It's, it's totally true. Um, and obviously, I keep banging on about the tap into emotions and keep stuff short and shareable. Um, so, how do you know you're getting it right? And obviously, I know that's spelt wrong, but right, because these things are always easy to remember. So, R is relevant. Is it relevant to your audience? Relevant to what you do? Is it relevant to what's going on in the world? Relevance is absolutely key. There's so much irrelevant rubbish out there um, that you've got to be relevant. I, is it interesting? If it's not interesting, don't share it. Or does it inform people? So always say, look at your stuff and think, is it relevant? Is it interesting? Is it going to inform people on something? Timely or topical? Are you putting the tweet out at the right time of day? Is anybody listening? You know, If you're tweeting at four in the morning, perhaps you're not going to get much engagement. Um, unless something big's happened. Um, so thinking about the time of day, and don't forget, I've already mentioned evenings, weekends, lots of people online then. And is it topical? If it's, you can make a funny joke about something that's, that's in the news at the moment or whatever. So topicality, particularly as a journalist, is really important. E is engaging. Does it stimulate the emotions? Or does it educate? Or, really importantly, does it entertain? All these big E words are really the key to the successful formula in your tweets. So if you're going to engage your audience, you've got to um, educate or entertain. These are the two reasons we're online, really, either to be informed or to be entertained. We want to learn something or we want some fun to happen. So trying to do that. And then the extra bits. Does it add value? That's the really important thing. Does it add something to the great sum of journalism or somebody's life? And if you're just tweeting really boring stuff, why would anybody care? So. Try and add something, put something back, and then Twitter will work for you. I was going to play a um, video to end on, but I can't get it to work. But um, it's just a, you could actually just Google it. Um, we used to have a thing, uh, um, it's a public information thing for kids in, in the 70s and 80s called Charlie Says. So this cat would give advice. And forgive my language, but basically Charlie, Charlie says, we're going to the, um, the playground now, and I'm going to tweet about this. And, uh, and we're going on the swings, and we're going to have a good time. And the cat says, um, wow, 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 wow. Charlie says, only tweet things people will give a shit about. And that's actually, that's all it's all about. So the, you tweet like a ninja by putting important, interesting stuff out. So thank you all very much for coming. And if you do want to ask any questions, please, uh, we've got a few minutes, five minutes. Ooh, there's a question there. This is great. Actually, how to schedule tweets? 
Sorry? How to schedule the tweets? Uh, do you use TweetDeck or you use Twitter for that? Like, what tools do you use? Oh, okay, yeah. Um, on the mobile, I would use mostly Twitter, um, or obviously on the desktop Twitter, but on, if I'm on the desktop, TweetDeck is absolutely invaluable as a journalist. Ooh, I did all this yesterday in the, in the How to Search Twitter course, so sorry. that. Um, so TweetDeck has multiple filters. You can put so much information in there. It's a really excellent tool for a journalist. I think it's an invaluable tool for a journalist. Um, the one thing that Twitter is pretty rubbish at is lists. It's quite difficult to make lists, and it's quite difficult to look at lists. So there is an app that I use to look at lists called Tweet Logics with an X, Tweet Logics, um, and that is, I think, the fastest way to look at lists on the on the go because Twit uh, Tweet Deck doesn't come on on mobile. So mostly that's how I would use it. Any other? I'll take a picture of you up before. You'll go. Any other questions? Look at you. Oh, look, smile. <laughs> then I can tweet it. Thank you. Um, any more questions, anyone? No? Have I answered your questions? Hopefully, do you feel more confident to tweet like ninjas now? Does it make a bit more sense? Anyway, thanks very much indeed. Oh, one. Yeah. Is there a... What's the statistic on Twitter, Twitter users? I mean, in Italy, I don't think it's as popular as Facebook, for example. Or in England, uh, is it more... Uh, are people using more Twitter than other social media? Yeah, I think in there's... some uh, places and... Yeah, you'd need to look at the stats for individuals. I can't tell you what the no, stats no, for no. Italy are, I'm afraid, but there, there are a lot of people using it, and certainly a lot of journalists. There tends to be a bit of an echo bubble a lot of journalists are on Twitter, therefore I think there's sometimes a, um, a added emphasis to a story that maybe is like, horror, somebody's done something wrong. And actually, it's, there's only a small number of us who've really realized what's going on. But it is, um, you know, my, my kids are joining Twitter. Um, there's a lot of, you know, it's great for fans. It's great for, you know, music and um, films and TV particularly. People are tweeting along the second screen thing, so they're watching telly and, and using the Twitter at the same time. So... Um, great interaction, engagement there. But certainly as a journalist, that and actually also Instagram is where you need to look for people sharing photos of breaking news stories and stuff. So as a news tool, I find it extraordinarily useful. Oh, another one behind you. Hi. Uh, how do you choose the hashtag? And uh, uh, do you make a research before or you... You don't know. Uh, you guess, first of all. Um, or otherwise you think... Uh, normally, in a breaking news situation, the hashtag is what's happened or where it's happened. So it tends to be the place that something has happened or maybe, you know, earthquake or something. Um, generally, it's where something has happened. Uh, if it's a more specific hashtag, I would think, who do I know that might know? So maybe it's a legal story. I might look at a, a lawyer friend of mine or maybe it's, um, you know, something like that. I'll find the person who is likely to know. Or you can guess. You can put things in. Top tip, though, if you are going to be using hashtags, always check them first. Always check them, because there's a lot of really dodgy ones out there, and there's some rude things on them. So don't, you know, just be aware that there might be hashtags that are inappropriate, um, and also that read correctly. So they, you know, make sure the word reads properly. So I have an excellent, um, several examples of being awful, but I didn't think it would translate in English, um, you know, for the audience here. So... Check your hashtags first. Somebody somewhere will know more than you do. You could always ask your audience what's the best hashtag. Um, but otherwise, make one up. You know, guess. But if you're the one at the breaking news story, just kind of figure this is what's happened. German wings crash. You know, it's airlines or flight numbers or that kind of stuff. And that's it. Everybody, thank you very much. Have a good day.